Uh, text for this morning is going to be first letter of Timothy in chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And that can be found on page 1187 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. If you'd all rise with me for the reading of his word. <clears throat> First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning we do praise you. You are the one from whom all blessings flow. All good things come from you. Primarily amongst them is the gift of salvation. The gift of your son. That whoever believes would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, we thank you this morning Hopefully we thank you every day, every moment, all our days for the fact that you came and traded yourself for us, the righteous for the unrighteous. You went to a cross. You took our punishment. You were buried. We praise you that you did not stay dead, but that you rose to life bodily, physically, fully, completely and because of that we too have hope of resurrection we have peace with God we are counted as righteous and we have been given such a great and wonderful opportunity privilege charge command to share this good news with others and I pray this morning that as we go through this portion of this letter that Paul wrote to this young pastor, Timothy, that we would hear it with our own own ears, our own hearts, that we would not just push this aside for someone else, but that this morning you would call us again to yourself and to your mission, to the great privilege of knowing you and making you known. Jesus changed lives this morning, here, or watching at home, or whoever might see this at a later time. We pray that you would, through the power of your spirit, bring them to life in Jesus Christ for your glory alone. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be, you may be seated. So we have been walking through 1 Timothy in this series that we've titled Living as God's Household. This is how Paul will describe the church to Timothy in just a couple of chapters and just a few verses. He'll refer to us as the household of God. And as you know, especially during that day and time, it was not uncommon that the household was about the father's business. It was about the family business. In fact, that's what Jesus said when his earthly parents found him. Uh, They had been worried sick looking for him and found him at the temple there when he was 12 years old. Didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? I would be in my father's house and about his business. So church, as the household of God, we are to be about the father's business. And that business, as explained by Paul to Timothy, is guarding uh, the gospel. It's guarding what has been entrusted to him and to all believers. 
And so we began with that pledge, and Paul was laying out for us and for Timothy, just reminding him of the things that had gone on before, before he left for Macedonia, some of the, the challenges that were there in Ephesus. And he's reminding uh, Timothy, uh, young man, you are in position there to lead God's household, and as such, there are some things you need to be thinking about on guard against that you need to be fighting against. Namely, uh, some false teaching of some who wanted to be teachers of the law but did not, he says, even understand what they were talking about. Uh, that is not uncommon in our day and time. There's uh, any number of people who, because of the internet, have the ability to go out and teach on things they know nothing about. And unfortunately, some people listen to them and then they don't know anything about it either. Uh, but for Timothy, uh, Paul is saying, you know the truth of the gospel, and so stand against these Judaizers, these ones who would use the law, uh, much like in the Galatian church, as a, as a tool to separate, to divide, to be exclusive, uh, to lead people away from the true gospel. And uh, also then, uh, your motivation in this is what? That our motivation is love from a good conscience. And so, as we saw last week, as Pastor Corey shared with us, uh, the, it sum, sum, summarized, or was summarized at the end of what we call chapter one, with this charge to fight the good fight with a good conscience and not to, uh, not to give way to your conscience and in so doing so shipwreck your faith and, those of, and the faith of those who may listen to you. Now, I kind of joked about the fact that there's a lot of people out there talking about a lot of things they don't know about, but when it comes to the gospel, this is very serious. This is why you will continually hear us say from the front, don't get your theology, don't get your view of the gospel from the internet. There's all kinds of false messages out there. It's so easy for it to work its way into people's hearts and lives. Even this week, again, uh, just on social media, we see a, another viral kind of situation where some, some things have been added to Scripture to, to give meaning and thought and, and, and to make people feel warm and fuzzy inside. But it's not, it's not the truth of, of, of the Word of God. It's, it's addition to, and it leads people into things uh, that, that they don't even realize what's happening. Uh, there, a couple of different times today, uh, this week, I've seen things like that from people that I know and love and respect. It's so easy today to be led astray by false messages that we don't even realize, unless we know God's word, are false. It's creeped in. It's full blown in the church. Last week, Pastor Corey mentioned a, a, a prominent Southern Baptist church that is that is going through and doing some things and accepting some things that are, are not scriptural. They're not godly. We must guard the gospel deposit as the household of God. We must keep a good conscience. This is our charge. And yet, so often, and I'm speaking as a pastor, because pastors know this, and if you've spent any time in any kind of leadership, you know this is true. It's easy after a while to get used to what you know, and you kind of know the ins and outs, and you know what needs to happen and what shouldn't. You even can spot false teachings, perhaps. And we react. We, we push against those things. Or we want people to come to Christ, and so we, we spend time strategizing. Those things are not bad until they become things that we're doing in our, in our own strength. When we start to serve or we start to minister or we start to proclaim or anything you do in your own strength, but especially when it comes to guarding the gospel, it's not burnout that you have to worry about. That will happen, but it's ineffectiveness and it's failure because we are not capable of fighting this fight, especially if there is an enemy and there is who is fighting against us. We will burn out physically, but more likely and more dangerously, we can burn out spiritually. We can start to slip a little bit. There can be chinks in the armor, and we may ourselves begin to believe things for pragmatism's sake or other things that are against the gospel. We have to be on our guard, and we can't do it in our own strength. Even if we could do it in our own strength, we couldn't do it because only God can effectuate the power of the gospel to bring people to life in Christ. We cannot save anyone. It's sort of like, and if you're, I don't know, under 20 
or under, maybe even under 30. Just ignore this part for a second. But it's sort of like if you go back and look in history or if you, in your lifetime, uh, maybe you have had a, I don't know, a two by four to saw. And you get out the old hand saw, right? You put some elbow grease into it. And one's not so bad, but what if you have to saw, I don't know, five or ten? At some point, you would benefit from a different tool. And so we are thankful for electricity and things like power tools. It's a little loud, but it gets the job done a lot quicker and a lot better. And we don't tire out. Why? Because we are utilizing power from elsewhere to do the same job. And that is a basic thought process for us this morning that when it comes to guarding the gospel, when it comes to fighting the good fight, we must do so not in our own strength and power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God himself. Because if we don't, we will fail. We will falter, we will tire, we will get worn. And that's just talking about our own faith. What will it do to the faith of those who God has placed in our lives? To the neighbor who does not know him, to the coworker who is lost, to the enemy who needs Jesus. What will it do for them if we are fighting on our own? And so with that in mind, we come to the beginning of chapter 2, what we call chapter 2. Paul is simply continuing his thought And he's laid out this charge here at the end of one, fight the good fight, Timothy. And now he's going to begin making a turn in his letter. This is how we fight the good fight. And the first thing he says in verses one and two is this, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. First of all, there is not simply a, this is number one on my list of things to do. This is indeed talking about the priority of prayer. And as we have it this morning, uh, the priority of gospel-centered prayer would be our first point that we see here, because that's what he's talking about, is gospel-centered prayer. First of all, most important, when you're going to fight the fight, Make sure not only that you uh, do like he wrote to the Ephesian church itself, put on the whole armor of God, but be people of prayer. Timothy, first of all, the first thing you need to do before you do anything else, the thing that matters most, the thing that's going to determine victory or defeat in this fight is prayer. And he lists for us some different kinds of prayer. Some people look at this and they think, oh, these are all just types of prayer. They're they're just synonyms. They're different things that we do. But Paul, actually, if we go and look at each one of these, there's a message in the ones that he's laying out for us specifically. And so I want to unpack that for us for just a moment. He urges that entreaties be made. Entreaties, the, the, the Greek word is dehesis, and it means it's a prayer for a need. There's something that's needed that is not possessed by the one in need of it. And I would uh, promote to you this morning, I would lay out for you that this prayer, this need, clearly is the gospel itself. And so when you are beginning to fight the good fight, Timothy, the first thing to do is to go to God in gospel-centered prayer and make sure that you are praying for the need of salvation in the lives of those that you will encounter. Pray for their need. There's no bigger need for any person on earth. This is why simply doing social justice is not the gospel. Simply feeding people is not the gospel. Simply clothing people is not the gospel. Simply telling people uh, that, they're, that they're good and encouraging them and strengthening them in their, in their psyche and coming alongside them and meeting physical needs is not the gospel. It leaves people fed but lost. Their need is Christ. All those other things should be done in love, but if we only leave it at that and we don't share the gospel with them, we've lost. And so here at the beginning, if we're going to fight this good fight, guarding the gospel, proclaiming the truth of the gospel, we need to be praying that people's spiritual need will be met. There's no greater need. 
Then he uses the, the word prayers, and we would say, well, all, all of these are prayers, aren't they? Well, yes, but there, again, is a specific word in the Greek that's used here that's used specifically for this, and the word is prosuke. And it means addressed uh, prayers that are addressed to God. Aren't all prayers addressed to God? Well, yes, in a manner of speaking. Yes, they are. But there are many prayers that go on in our world that are not addressed to the creator God of the universe. And there are prayers that we sort of just throw up as a prayer throughout the day, sort of like a, almost a wish <laughs> if we're thinking about it. Now, they should be prayers to God, but this is a specific idea that we would come to God himself. Now, again, this seems self-explanatory. Who else are we going to go to? Well, sometimes we go to ourselves. Sometimes we go to a brother or sister in Christ. Sometimes we go to a mentor and we ask advice and we seek their wisdom. This is coming to God himself, addressing him on behalf of those who need him as we fight the good fight. They have no bigger need, and so there's no one else we can go to but him. Then he uses the word petitions. This word is in, uh, in, uh, in euxis. It means falling in with. It's, it's more than just coming alongside of. It's empathy. It's getting into the situation with the person, feeling what they're feeling, experiencing what they're experiencing. In other words, it's coming alongside of them and having our lives affected by what they are experiencing or, or what they need. As it regards to the gospel, as it, regards to, uh, it relates to that, uh, this would be the idea of having compassion. When we think of Jesus and he looks on the crowds, he has compassion on them because he sees that they are like sheep without a shepherd. They are lost, and it moves him, and it moves him to action. And so Paul is telling Timothy, offer prayers that are petitions on behalf of those who are lost because of their lostness, that it troubles us and our souls that there are lost people around us that we lose sleep because there are people around us who are lost. And then he ends it with the word thanksgivings, prayers of thanksgiving. He asks that all of these be made behalf, on behalf of all men. Thanksgivings is the word eucharistia. It's where we hear, and you may have heard or caught it right there, the word eucharist is what is referred, uh, used to refer to uh, the Lord's Supper. When we come together in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we are observing and remembering out of grateful hearts that Jesus Christ gave himself for us, shed his righteous, pure, precious blood for a sinner like me. There's nothing that we should be more grateful for, more contented by. Than this, the gospel applied the salvation of our souls. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, when you're fighting this fight, the most important thing you can do is to start off in gospel-centered prayer that prays for all men that they would have their need of the gospel met by the God who is the one who changes and saves lives that we would not rest until we see them saved, and that we would glorify Christ in all things, whether the person we've been praying for our entire life is saved or not, that we would give glory and thanksgiving to the one who saves. This is of utmost importance. Pray for all men. Pray for all men, Timothy. Now this is in contrast to the exclusivism that is happening there in Ephesus. There are those who are basically Judaizers that he's already mentioned, and I mentioned earlier, that are using the law to say only if you do these things, only if you're under the law can you be saved. And he's fighting against that and telling Timothy, fight against that false gospel. But there's also another group that's uh, thought to be present in Ephesus, and there's some different things for this, and this would be the idea of Gnosticism or proto-Gnosticism. It may be that, as we 
looked at last week Hymenaeus, uh, who was handed over uh, to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. We, we learn uh, later that one of the things he was doing is that he was uh, rejecting the, the truth and validity of the resurrection, of a physical resurrection. And this would be a, a Gnostic type of idea. It would be a Greek idea. The, the resurrections happened, so it was a spiritual resurrection. So all that matters is spiritual. And if you, uh, it doesn't matter what you do in your physical world and in your life. So go ahead and live as you wish. Just spiritually be right with God. That sounds a lot like the garbage that goes on in our country today. The messages that we see. Even churches that are trying to help people be spiritual. What that means is we want you to stay lost. Because spirituality is popular, but the gospel is not. Dying to live is an affront to our individualistic desire for self-gratification and self-glorification. And so denying the physical resurrection, the gospel itself in this way, the, the Gnostics had this idea that it was all about what you knew in this enlightenment. And so from that side, you get the idea of, of if you don't have the right knowledge, if you don't know the right things, if you haven't been enlightened like we have, you can't be saved. We see this thought specifically alluded to in 1 Timothy 6, 20. If you've been reading through it each week, you've already read this verse. But there, Paul, uh, talking to Timothy as he's finishing this letter, uh, telling him to guard, uh, guard what has been entrusted to him, the gospel, uh, points out these op opposing arguments that are falsely called knowledge, gnosis. And so on two sides, you have people potentially here in Ephesus that are fighting against the true gospel and telling people you can't be, on the one hand, a, a believer if you don't follow Jewish law. On the other hand, you can't be a believer if you don't have this wisdom and knowledge that we have. And Paul is saying, look, Timothy, forget all of that. Pray for all men to be saved. There's nothing exclusive about this. The gospel is very inclusive. Anyone who believes will receive eternal life. Now, practically for us, we, we need to bring that back a moment. Although we do have Gnosticism and law-keeping and all that around today, in our context as the Western United States Church, which oftentimes puts us in one camp politically or otherwise, or at least just patriotically, who are the all peoples that we would reject? Who are the all peoples that we would fail to pray for, that we would not want to pray for? Just as human beings, when we have that person that is our enemy, who Jesus has told us to love, do we pray for them and for their salvation? What about Muslims? especially the ones who are radicalized and who want all Christians to be killed, do we pray for their salvation? What about the Chinese who are such a political threat today and communism? And yes, even what's happening right now with Russia, do we pray for their salvation? Or do we simply pray against them and say, not in my backyard? The gospel is inclusive to all men. Lift up these prayers for salvation for all men, all types. Then he goes on. Timothy, pray for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Timothy, as you're seeking to proclaim the gospel, as you're seeking to guard the the trust that has been given to you, be in prayer for those who are in authority. In Romans 13, we hear Paul writing to the church at Rome, reminding them that the leaders, those who are in authority, uh, the political leaders, they are placed there under the sovereignty of God. He has caused them to, raise, to rise to power. We don't under, always understand why, especially when they're evil, but I want to go to right there. In this moment when Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, Nero is emperor of Rome. It is under Nero that Paul will be uh, sacrificed. He was, he was beheaded. I about said crucified. He wasn't crucified literally, but he will die. He will be martyred for his faith under this very emperor who, as we know from history, the story is uh, the, the, the city was set on fire in Rome and he blamed it on the Christians and great persecution came upon the church. 
in that kind of environment. Timothy, pray for the kings and those in authority. Pray gospel-centered prayer for them. Why? Because it will promote an environment that allows for the gospel to be shared. Pray that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life. Tranquil, peace from without, or peace within. Uh, Quiet life, peace in society around us. That people will be at peace with the gospel, with the church, with the people of God, so that we may freely share this good news. Oh, we'll share it under persecution if we must, but how much more so if we have the freedom to do so? Church, we have the freedom in this country to do so. We are not persecuted. Are we praying and taking advantage of the tranquil and quiet lives we have that God has blessed us with? goes on in all godliness and dignity. In godliness and dignity, that is our approach to the world. Do we share the gospel in godliness and with dignity, or do we use it as a billy club against our enemies? Do we pray for the salvation of those who need him most, or do we point out their flaws like the law keepers? And in doing so, pass judgment on them and their souls, not only by our distaste for them and our disdain for them, but also by our failure to pray that they would be saved. Another writer in early church history, still experiencing the, uh, the persecutions of the, the empire, so to speak, Theophilus of Antioch, he wrote this. The honor I will give the emperor is all the greater because I will not worship him, but I will pray for him. I will worship no one but the true and real God. I'm going to hold to the gospel, for I know that the emperor was appointed by him. Those give real honor to the emperor who are well disposed to him, who obey him, and who pray for him. Do we pray for those in authority over us? Not simply that God would give them wisdom, yes. Certainly not that God would replace them with another, do something to them, get them out of office, Lord. The prayer we should be praying is, Lord, save their soul. That's what Paul's saying here. John MacArthur on this note said this, what a movement of God would come across this country if we spent our energy and our effort praying for the salvation of these. But instead of that, we find ourselves speaking evil of leaders with whom we disagree and trying to create Christian power groups to replace them. And we become the enemy. And in many ways, I think we pollute for them the water of life. The church is always to function in spiritual duty and spiritual discipline, never by worldly means. Live the truth in godliness and dignity. The world should see the church as an ally, as a blessing, as people to run to. And the way that they will see this happen is if we do what Paul's talking about and our first and really only concern for the world around us is that they be saved. And yes, that includes those political leaders we do not agree with. Regardless of how evil they may be, in that case we should be praying all the more. And so with what's happening right now in the world, That's what I'm going to do right now. So if you'll bow your heads in prayer with me. Father God, I come before you now and I want to confess my sin of failing to pray for kings and those in authority, for enemies and those who need you most. And so, Lord, today, as there is turmoil, as there is war going on right now, 
across the world. Yes, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in harm's way, that they would stand firm and that the gospel might be proclaimed. But Lord Jesus, more than that this morning, I want to pray for these leaders. Lord, I pray for President Putin, that through the power of your spirit, you will grab a hold of his heart and save him. Lord, I pray for President Zelensky as he stands leading his country to defend themselves, Lord, help him to find sufficiency and hope in the name of Jesus Christ for his heart to be changed, for him to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for President Biden, who as leader of the United States has much influence Lord, I pray that you would save his soul, that he would repent of his sins, that he would seek your face, and he would be changed. Lord, I pray for Prime Minister Johnson, another great world leader in the West, influential. Lord, save his life. Bring him to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that he would begin living for you, and not out of worldly wisdom, or of first concern for national security or the other things of this world. Lord, I pray for President Xi in China and for all the things going on there and the possible ramifications of what's happening right now in the future. Lord, save this communist dictator's life for your glory. Lord, all of these men need you and many, many more in our own country leadership, in our state leadership, in our city leadership, and in the world, the world over. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would save these people, that you would save their souls, that they would come to know Jesus, and that re- the result would be peace and love and hope and an end to these things. Now, Lord, we know that it's not ever truly, fully going to happen until you return, but we know that you have the power. We see all the time in your word, you moving people and using people for your glory, and yes, saving even pagans. Lord, Jonah went to a city called Nineveh, and the king repented. We pray for these lives to be changed and saved, that there would be a cessation of hostility and that the gospel would be pushed forth across the world because there is an environment where it can flourish. We know, Lord, that your will may be continued persecution and continued war, and we even thank you for that because in the wisdom and goodness of your glorious sovereignty, it is right and good. And so we thank you, Lord, for that Whatever you're going to do, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do we pray in this way? We can sit back and say, oh, it doesn't mean anything. Those are just words. It'll never work. And the truth is, unfortunately, some of us sitting here may have thought that very thing during that prayer. Empty exercise. Shame on us. What is the purpose of gospel-centered prayer? Verses 3 and 4. The purpose of gospel-centered prayer. Why do, we, why do we do this? Why is this a priority? Why is this of first importance as we guard and fight the good fight? This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the purpose. First of all, because it's good and pleasing to God. That means even if he's not going to save a single person, If that's what he decides to do, which the next part tells us that's not what he's going to do. But even if it was, the fact that he's commanded us and asked us to do this, and it's pleasing and good in his sight, is reason enough. So these types of prayers, this gospel-centered prayer, for those who we have already decided will never come to know him, who are we to make that decision? That's the judgment we should not judge people with. Even if it was all true and they're lost and hopeless, do it anyway because it pleases God. It's morally right. It's good. It's pleasing. It's an offering. It's God glorifying. 
And yet we know from this, why is it pleasing? Because God does desire to save souls. He does desire to save souls. He desires all men, every type of person on this planet, every ethnicity, every person who will call on his name. He has a desire that they should be saved and he will do it, but he asks us, no, he commands us to participate by praying for them that he would do it. See, this is the thing where we can get off in a ditch when we talk about the sovereignty of God. Well, if God's going to do it, why does it matter what I do? Because he's commanded you and asked you and told you and invited you to participate. This is good and pleasing to him. He desires all men to to be saved and to know and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Matthew 28, the Great Commission Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and doing what? Teaching them to observe all I've commanded, that they come to the knowledge of the truth, that they understand and experience and communicate and proclaim the gospel, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Who are we to think that we were somehow worthy or better than the one that is our worst enemy or the most godless person we can think of? That was us. Stop believing the lie that we are good people. We are lost rebels against the king. And he saved us and he can and will save whomever he desires to. And he wants them to come to this knowledge of the truth, that their lives will be changed and that they will then also guard this trust and fight the good fight. That's the purpose. This is why we do it. What's the power Verse 5 through 7, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I, Paul, was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The power of gospel-centered prayer is found in Jesus Christ, the Word of God Himself, the Gospel. There is only one God and mediator. So we cannot go to a lost world and tell them, here's five ways to be a better person. They will be a better person who will still go to hell. We cannot accept that all roads lead to God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There is one mediator, only God saves, only Christ saves. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And it is the power of God that raised Christ from the dead that will raise dead men and women, boys and girls who are lost and dead in their sin to life in Christ Jesus. You cannot do it. We have to get on our knees and go to the power source. He was shared as a ransom for all. He gave his life to buy back those who were stolen by the enemy, born under the curse of sin, captive to sin. Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, broke that power and has bought them back, purchased them with his own precious blood. You didn't die for anyone. You can't save anyone, but he can. So stop trying to do it in your own strength. At the proper time, God stepped into the world. The testimony came forward. The word of God, the living word, the logos, came and dwelt among us. We beheld him. He was full of grace and truth. And we need to share that grace and truth. It's why Paul was here. It's why I was made a preacher. I'm not lying. Look, whatever those false teachers are telling you about me, it's it's a lie. I came only to share the good news, the life-changing power of the gospel. It's why I'm here. It's why you're here, Timothy. And if Paul was here today, he would tell us here, First Baptist, it's why you're here. Do we believe that God will save people? Do we care? Jonah knew. And he specifically didn't want it to happen. God does save. 
It's the last time I mentioned MacArthur today, I promise. But he made an observation on, on this passage, thinking through this. Think about those who pray in Scripture in the New Testament. Specifically, he mentions two things. One, Jesus on the cross. When he's hanging on the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In short, Jesus was saying, save them. And just a few days later, a few weeks later, Peter stood up in front of a crowd and 3,000 came to faith in Christ that day, some of whom, no doubt, were amongst the crowds that said, crucify him. If we flip one through in the book of Acts to chapter 6, we meet a young man named Stephen. Stephen is called before the religious leaders, and he gives a testimony to the gospel and to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. And the result is that he is stoned to death by one named giving his approval there, Saul. But as he's dying, Peter, excuse me, Stephen prays for them, not that this would not be held against them, but that they would have their eyes open, that they would be saved. And that young man standing there giving his approval and two chapters later in Acts time is met on a road where he's going to persecute other believers by Christ himself and his life has changed. Were Stephen's prayers answered? Were Jesus' prayers answered? Does God respond to a prayer of salvation for people we don't even know? For kings and those in authority? For those we'll never meet? For our worst enemy? Does he respond to this prayer? If not, why do we not pray it? If he does respond, why do we not pray it? Do we believe that he saves people? Why do we not pray for him to do so? It's of first importance. It's of priority. So what is our posture when we come to centered, gospel-centered prayer? Verse 8, Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Now, I say posture, and we can read the verse, and we can say, oh, we're supposed to lift up our hands. Well, Maybe. That's not what Paul's saying. The posture that he's referring to here is the posture of our hearts. So whether we do like we will do often, which is kneel or close our eyes and bow our heads, or whether we stand like they would have done uh, in the synagogues and raise their hands in prayer with their faces toward heaven, that posture doesn't matter. That posture doesn't matter. What matters is the posture of our hearts. What are we doing in this prayer? So as we go through this verse, first of all, he gives some clear direction about who needs to be leading these prayers. In the church, in every place, that's what he's referring to there is every place. So there are house churches throughout Ephesus, but we can go even to the other cities where he's at. There's meetings of the church, and then they will gather together. When they're gathered together as the church in a formal gathering as the church of God, men who will, in chapter 3, we'll see, are elders, leaders, deacons, Take your rightful role and stand before the body on behalf of the body to God himself and lead in prayer, praying for these people and these conditions, praying that the gospel would go forth. Men, stop shirking our responsibility. Be the leaders of our homes. Pray aloud on behalf of our families, on behalf of the lost before God with our families. And when we come together as the church, deacons, elders, men, leaders, let us be a church that stands and prays gospel-centered prayer for the world around us. We will never be effective in this community or any other if we do not start with this prayer. And it starts with us being men of God and leading in this way. Now what is our our posture? I've adopted this apparently at the moment. (laughs) It just kind of happened and I became aware of it. But the posture he's talking about with holy hands is, it can be lifting your hands, but he's talking about 
literally holy hands, our condition of our spirit in that moment. In fact, there's a word used here for holy hands, which is different than the one we usually see. So throughout scripture, we see the word translated holy is usually hagios, which, which appears 248 times. And that means sacred, set apart. That's when we say God is holy, hagios. But that's not the one that he's talking about here. He actually is going upping the ante on us because when we come before a holy, sacred, set apart, holy, undefiled God, he uses the word hasias, which is only used 11 times. And it does literally mean undefiled by sin, pure, pious. It goes back to the idea that our, our goal, verse 5 of chapter 1, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So when we come before God and we pray for those who are lost, may we first be praying for ourselves that God would uh, identify and remove sin, that we would confess our sin, and then may we, with pure motives and heart for the desire of their, their salvation to the glory of God, lift up prayers for them. All of these types from verse 1. In other words, imprecatory prayers are not what he's talking about. We think about the Psalms. Lord, I pray that you would grind my, I'm making this up, that you would grind my enemies down to dust and you would trample them out and that I may shake them off the dust of my feet. I mean, that's not what we're talking about. God, get that person and give me justice. No. God, the way they hurt me the way they despitefully used me, the way they were evil to me, it shows me that they clearly don't know you. Lord, save them. You see, we can try all the nice programs and ideas, and if we're not praying that God would save souls, and we're not doing it from a pure heart and motive, if the cry of our heart is not, God, get them, but God, save them, we will never accomplish what we've been commanded to do. not with wrath or without wrath and dissension. In other words, we have to do this unified as the body of Christ, in unity, not in anger. So again, no imprecatory prayers, please. No Jonah prayers. He didn't actually pray those, but you know he thought it. Smite the Ninevites, no. That we would pray not in our anger and not angry with one another and not wrath upon them, but that God's wrath would be spared, that the wrath that Jesus bore in their place would be realized and applied like it was for us, like it was for me. Not with dissension. If we go back to the original, the word dissension there means doubt. It's not just that we're not getting along, it's that we doubt that it can happen, folks. When we pray gospel-centered prayers for those who need Jesus most, for leaders and those in authority, for our neighbor who keeps messing on our, our property line and screwing something up, I don't know, whatever it might be. Pray for them, believing not only that God can, but that he will. Make an entreaty for them because they have a need that cannot be met any other way. Make that to God, the only one who can change their lives. Feel the hurt and pain of lostness that they live in every day. And they give thanksgiving to God who alone can save and who has the power to change them for his glory. And we all nod our heads. And I'm not trying to be hard on us. I'm just trying to be, I'm just trying to keep it real for a moment. I already prayed and confessed that I don't do this. So why should you all? Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Hayden Haddon, wrote a book called The Soul Winner. And in that he wrote these words. One more thing. The soul winner must be a master of the art of prayer. 
You cannot bring souls to God if you do not go to God yourself. You must get your battle axe and your weapons of war from the armory of sacred communication with Christ. If you are much alone with Jesus, you will catch his spirit. You will be fired with the flame that burned in his breast and consumed his life. You will weep with the tears that fell upon Jerusalem when he saw it perishing. And if you cannot speak so eloquently as he did, yet there shall be about what you say somewhat of the same power which in him thrilled the hearts and awoke the consciences of men. My dear hearers, especially you members of the church, I am always so anxious lest any of you should begin to lie upon your oars and take things easy in the matters of God's kingdom. There are some of you, I bless you, and I bless God at the remembrance of you, who are in season and out of season in earnest for winning, for winning souls, and you are truly wise. But I fear there are others whose hands are slack, who are satisfied to let me preach, but do not themselves preach, who take these seats and occupy these pews and hope the cause goes well, but that is all they do. We would be fooling ourselves if we do not believe that Spurgeon could have been writing about us. The point today is not to weigh a guilt trip, lay a guilt trip on anyone. It's that Jesus Christ, through his word, from Paul to Timothy, would stir a fire in us that will catch flame and that we will take the responsibility and will follow through in obedience to pray for those who are lost in this community, in this state, in this country, in this world, especially those that we have no ability to speak to, the powerful, the decision makers, the warmongers, the greedy, that we would pray for them that God will save their souls. Not to make it easier for us, although that could be a benefit, but that he would be glorified and another one will be saved for eternity and they will stand before him and proclaim salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. In short, as believers, church, we must fight the good fight first and foremost in fervent prayer, believing that God can and will save souls. So normally I would pray at this point and we would transition, but I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up because we are going to pray. And our prayer is going to take the form of a song. We're going to sing our prayer in response today that God would do this, that he would save men and women, boys and girls, those least like him and furthest from him for his glory. You will not know this song because it has been locally sourced. I don't want to embarrass or point anybody out, but God used Carla to write this song. And he did so before this service ever came into being, but we are going to sing it because it is the heart of this passage. And this morning it will be our closing prayer and our victory song and our call to arms and our call to fight on our knees. And our yes, our amen. Let's stand together. With one voice we pray in the power of your name for the nations who know who you are. With one heart we come by the power of your blood in all how you so love the world. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All blessing and glory and wisdom and honor and power to the great I am. Please, oh Lord, save my 
God bless those who preach the gospel of peace, proclaiming your death on the cross. You rose from the tomb, and you're coming soon. The one who is risen is to come. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. is and is to come.